Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for the warm wishes and for the introduction. And thanks, everyone here. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you for your warm welcome. And thank you for joining us as we talk about uh, the invisible wounds of war. The Bush Institute's Invictus Games Symposium uh, that addresses this issue that affects so, so many uh, veterans and uh, soldiers and returning military. So thanks especially to our generous sponsors today. To Johnson & Johnson, CEO Alex Gorski will speak later today. Carolyn and Mark Spies, the American Friends of the Royal Foundation, and the Fisher House Foundation. A special thanks to Ken Fisher, who serves on the boards of the Invictus Games. Thank you for your important work. And thank you for bringing this year's Invictus Games to the United States. I especially want to thank Prince Harry for joining us today. George and I are thrilled to be part of the terrific Invictus Games competition that he founded. I'm grateful for the many veterans and military leaders who are here with us. Thank you for your service and for your leadership. And of course, a heartfelt thanks to the military families for your devotion to your, um, to your family members and your loved ones. So happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers here, especially the mothers joining us as competitors and as caregivers. Mothers have the most important job in the world and today we celebrate youth, so thank you for spending part of your special day with us. It's important that we honor the mothers and caregivers in our lives by discussing the topic of today's symposium, addressing the invisible wounds of war. George and I are committed to caring for our veterans and their families through the work at the Bush Institute. We celebrate the service and the sacrifice of our veterans at the Warrior 100, a 100 kilometer bike ride that we host at our ranch in Crawford, and at the Warrior Open, a competitive golf tournament held in Dallas. We've listened to the Warriors tell their stories, their stories of triumph and of struggle. And through these testimonies, we recognize that the invisible wounds of war are not treated in the same way as the visible wounds. And that's why we're here today, to educate more people about those invisible wounds and how to care for them. So I'm happy now to introduce President George W. Bush and Prince Harry and two Invictus Games competitors, Lance Corporal J.J. Chalmers and Master Sergeant Israel Del Toro. These warriors will talk about their injuries and their recovery, and they'll tell us how to, all warriors can seek better support and care for invisible wounds. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Thank you, Mrs. Bush. Yeah. Uh, Prince Harry, let's, let's start with you. Uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. The, these are, in a very real sense, your games. We're just hours away from the opening ceremony. And we're here talking about, specifically, the invisible wounds of war, uh, which afflict so many veterans. Uh, the numbers tell us six times, perhaps, as many as the visible wounds. Well, why, why have you made addressing invisible wounds such an important part of your agenda? I think, um, firstly, hello everyone, world media and everybody else sitting here. This is a lovely place to be sitting right now. Um, I think, I think the, the Invictus Games in 2014 in London, and whether we wanted it to or not, of course we wanted it to, whether we were aware of it, smashed the stigma around physical injuries. Um, and I really, what I really hope is that for Orlando, that we can do the same for, for, for invisible injuries. 
the majority of the guys that I speak to uh, through the personnel recovery unit at Wellington Barracks and places like that, um, I've spoken to everybody from who have severe PTSD through to uh, minor depression, anxiety, whatever it be, and everyone says the same thing. If, if you can deal with it soon enough, if you can deal with it quick enough and actually have the ability and the platform to be able to speak about it openly, then you can fix these problems. And if you can't fix them, then you can at least find coping mechanisms. And that's what it's all about. There's no reason why people should be hiding in shame after they've served their country. President Bush. Well, first of all, I'm uh, delighted to be with you, Prince Harry. And I want to thank you for serving in the military and then worrying about the people you served with. It's, I, I, I'm confident you could have chosen another path. And, and you, chose to do the, <laughs> you chose to do the hard thing. And uh, we appreciate it. And thank you very much for the Invictus Games. Uh, Jeremy, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I miss saluting the vets. Uh, I have great respect for the men and women who volunteered for our military. Uh, I also understand that these men and women can be a tremendous asset for our country. Uh, and therefore, I want to be a part of tra helping them transition from the military to the private sector. And one of the real problems we have is uh, the invisible wounds of war. And Part of the reason why we're so thrilled the Invictus Games enabled us to join them is because this will give us a platform to say to vets, uh, it's okay to seek help. Uh, you're, you're, you're courageous before you got hurt, you're courageous now, and seeking help is a sign of courage. And as well, you'll hear some interesting discussions about what works and what doesn't work and how do we make sure that which works uh, is available for as many vets as possible. So we're thrilled to be here. I'm also really pleased that there's uh, 13 other nations because this is an issue that r relates to every vet, not just American vets. I Israel, you suffered critical external physical wounds more than 10 years ago. Uh, the recovery was very arduous. You were in a coma for four months, but you also suffered invisible wounds, traumatic brain injury. And you continue to deal with the consequences of that. How would you compare your experience with your visible wounds to your experience dealing with coping with the other, the, the other effects of what happened? Uh, well, obviously, they see my, my visible wounds, and they focus on that a lot. And yeah, it's important to address those you know, uh, visible wounds. But sometimes I forget about what's going on in my head. and and. They just focus on these things. So I think my family dealt, dealt more with my invisible wounds than people out there, because I would try not to show it. Uh, you know, I come from a career field where we're alpha. We have that alpha complex, and we don't want to let people think that we're hurt mentally, because we want to show that we still can still do the fight, still go out there and do what we want to do. So we hide it. and. Sometimes it's not the best way to do it. Uh, but luckily, I had good family support and good friends and teammates that were there. It's like, hey, DT, you're not right. I kind of argued with them. It's like, I wasn't right a long time ago, brother. But, <laughs> you know. <laughs> JJ, you were a commando. You, you come from the same mindset as Israel, uh, not, not showing any kind of weakness. Um, and you, you suffered critical physical wounds as well, but you talk a lot, you have talked a lot about your comrades in arms who suffered different kinds of wounds and how hard it has been for them to deal with the stigma attached to that. Absolutely, I mean, it, it's a simple fact. I was caught in the center of the blast and then there's a ripple effect that comes out from that and you're, you're, you're touched by it or not. And at the end of the day, half of my multiple was killed or injured. The other half had to stay there and deal with that situation. And I was in many ways lucky that, yes, I was taken out by a helicopter and I woke up in a hospital bed and then received the care I needed. These guys went on with their job that day and, and things only got worse in many respects. And then they came home and they can look at us and it's, it's very obvious that, that we require support and we require um, you know, adaptions and all the other things. Uh, and then they look at us and, and, and tragically, they place themselves at the bottom of the pile by going, He's wounded and he needs help. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't require help. Um, and that's, when I look at it, the complete opposite. I, I, you know, I consider myself extremely lucky that, yes, I came back from Afghanistan. 
broken physically, but mentally I was still the same person that went to Afghanistan and came back. And that was more or less either a stroke of luck or that I was lucky enough, in hindsight this is, to have done the right things at the early stages and to have probably to have had a great support network from my family, my wife now, um, and a few people along the way that if I hadn't had just some casual conversations, I don't think I would be sat, you know, there's a good chance I wouldn't be sat here doing this now. Uh, Prince Harry, you served in Afghanistan. H how, do we, how do we change that mindset, which is perhaps the most important stumbling block to getting treatment, is a willingness on the part of those suffering from invisible wounds to come forward. H how, do we, how do we get rid of the stigma and make it possible for people not to be ashamed when they talk about this? You know, it, it, it varies in so many different categories, uh, in so many different areas. Um, especially within the, the British forces, you've got the, the commandos and the paras who are very strong-minded and um, they're probably the, the last people to come forward if they had a, a, a mental health issue. But, um, you know, other, other people would be, would be more than happy to come forward. I think it's recognizing it in, recognizing it in yourself is a, is, is a huge part of it. You have to, the first step has to be um, admitting that you need to seek help. Um, and for a lot of these guys, they, they, it's just not part of, you know, it's, it's not part of the, it's not part of your DNA. You know, as, as, as Israel touched on, it's, it's this thing where you're, you believe that you're invincible. And, and, and when your mates around you are all getting, all getting uh, blown up, they, as, as JJ said, they're, they're the ones that all the concentration should be on. But you, everyone, needs to, everyone needs to help, and you need to be able to talk about it. But you're right, the stigma, not just within the military, but also within... Um, within, across the world, um, the stigma surrounding mental health is a big issue. I don't have necessarily the answers, but I know for a fact that the people I speak to, um, just being able to talk about it early on is, 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 is a huge, huge deal. And part of the problem, President Bush, uh, as the Institute has pointed out on numerous occasions, is that these conditions often overlap symptoms when you're yeah. talking about uh, post-traumatic stress, you're talking about traumatic brain injury, and sometimes the effects of traumatic brain injury make it harder to recognize what's wrong. Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, uh, the uh, science of figuring out the relationship between TBI and PTS, by the way, notice I dropped the D. I noticed. Uh, we don't view it as a disorder, we view it as an injury. I think it's really important, as in part, to deal with the stigma that people, uh, a, a troop, and remind me what the question was. Anyway, uh, <laughs> how, how traumatic brain injury? Not yet. I'm not quite through with this. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so Israel, if he, if, he, if he thinks he has an injury, says, I can get this fixed. If he thinks he has a disorder, he's going to say, people will shun me. Uh, or I'm not going to tell my commanders I have a disorder because they're not going to like treat me the way they treated me before. Question? <laughs> Look, I'm 70 years old this year. Not yet. No, not, not yet. yet. <laughs> well, well, this is obviously uh, a much larger country geographically oh, yeah, than I Prince Harry's country. Yeah, I now remember. So, uh, <laughs> you're not the only guy. Anyway. Uh, these, two, these two are a right pair. <laughs> and proudly so, I might add. Uh, <clears throat> the the, yeah, there are unbelievably good centers of excellence here, and I'm sure in England too, where uh, if somebody so chose could be diagnosed, wanted to be diagnosed, could be diagnosed well. The problem is uh, we got people who live in rural America, and they come home, and maybe their wife says, you got a problem, man, let's go get it fixed, and there's nobody to get it fixed with. I mean, they show up to the local MD, and he doesn't know what the heck to do. And so step two of this, the process in our mind is to make sure that the diagnostic tools are not only really good but widespread so that the cure can begin to take place and uh but you're right it's uh i i suspect and israel can talk about this if he wants to is that nothing would be more disheartening than to say i think i got a problem and go in to see a so-called expert who's not an expert and said you don't or you do and, but we're not sure what to do about it. And so uh, there's a lot to be done. Uh, and the purpose of this uh, forum uh, is to uh, just keep the process moving. Start in London, 
keep it moving. Israel, we were By the way, people need to know about Israel. He's on active duty. In the Air Force. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable. It's, it's, uh, I know the Secretary of Air Force is here. But it speaks to two things. We got a lot of military brass here. I think it's thanks to Harry. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a remarkable military that says this man still has talent. And I know the Secretary of Air Force is here, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, uh, and, I want, and it's also remarkable that Israel still wants to serve, but the fact that the military is willing to keep his talents alive for other troops is really a smart thing to do. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Israel, um, as we all know, uh, suicide is a problem in the veteran population. You, you told President Bush and me just a couple hours ago that you recently lost a teammate to suicide. In your experience, how effectively uh, are mental health issues being addressed now in the community? Well, it really depends on where you're at. It really is, you know, and what supports they have. You know, again, the president said, if you're out and, you know, bump up, I'm, whoops. <laughs> I, hope, I hope no one from the FCC is here. <laughs> Oops. What, you want to try that again? <laughs> out in rural America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my one. Yeah. <laughs> Better now than the opening ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. Um, but, you know, you're out there. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's a lot harder to get that support. Uh, sorry. Particularly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got blown up. I got an excuse. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's really based on the support and what hospitals are capable, you know, because like the president said if you go to a hospital that has no idea what's going on with you. And they're saying, do you seem fine to me? You know, it's really hard. And, and it's probably harder on the families because they're the ones dealing with you every day. They're the ones said, you got to go see help, you know, because you're not the same because they saw you when you left and they see you when you come back and they see the difference. So that's the real tough part is just really the facilities and support system, you know, because you know, again, you know, my, my buddy, you know, Clyde, that was his call sign, you know, A-10 pilot, distinguished flying cross of valor, and he just couldn't take it. It's tough, you know, because I talked to him two weeks before I ended his life, and, you know, you try and be there for a guy, but sometimes it's real hard for them, and you just, all you can do is try and help your teammate. JJ, I see you nodding your head. Uh, absolutely. Um, I think... One of the ways that we, one of the best chances we have of addressing this issue is if, if it comes from the guys themselves. Um, you know, we're taught from the very beginning of training, day one, week one, that you look after each other. That's, you know, it's a buddy-buddy system. And that should not stop ever. And it certainly shouldn't stop the day you leave the military. And if, if someone is going to want to find help, they should, they should be able to come first and foremost to, to their friends. And, your friends, at the end of the day, should be the people that should be able to notice the difference within it. Um, but that's all well and good. Uh, but they need to then know where they can take those questions to and what, what can be done about that. Um, but I've noticed a big difference in the last five years, most certainly since I was injured, um, of guys knowing where to go and, and, and also uh, being much more open and frank about it. Because we all know, yeah, as, as you said, we, we're trained to block away our emotions and get on with the job and do all these things. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're just human beings. And uh, like I say, I've said it before, I consider myself extremely lucky that I came back in one piece mentally. Uh, th this is all you know, by the by. Yes, it's been a struggle, but um, I have been myself throughout this process and I've had my friends beside me throughout this process. It should be the same for someone who's suffering from a, from a mental health issue. The, the, um, the, the signposting of, of where the help is needs to, we really need to focus on that. There's a lot of good help out there, and there's a lot of not so good help out there. As, uh, as the president touched on, you know, we, need to, we, need to, we need to signpost the really, the really good stuff. And 
It needs, it needs to be, the education needs to be more amongst the forces as well, I think. I think you know, the, the, the symptoms, the signs, so that everybody's aware of the, the, the early signs that, that happen. But, um, you know, it's, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a sad reality that individuals get into the position that they get into. You know, they've, they've served their country, they come back, and, and then, they, get, then they, slip off the, they slip off the radar. Um, but I know for a fact that all of these guys... Um, especially you know, now through the Invictus Games and stuff, but using things like Facebook and, and other forms of social media, they, they keep an eye on each other. And that's fantastic. You know, your military family, whether you're if from a different nation, different country, but if you end up meeting each other and you're worried and you see symptoms in each other, then going forward, you can, you can, you can keep a watchful eye over, over one another. And that's to me, is, is, is so important that these guys can look after each other. We've been focusing mostly on post-traumatic stress. Um, but here in the U.S. anyway, Prince Harry, traumatic brain injury has been a very big issue for at least the last decade, mostly because of the effects on football players. Of course, uh, in Great Britain, uh, there have been studies on rugby players as well, some uh, football, as you call it, players. But how, how much public awareness <laughs> is there in, in Britain about traumatic brain injury and the effect of multiple concussive events? Um, clearly, clearly not enough. I think, um, I think the, the lesson to be learned is that in America, you guys are way ahead of us in some areas. And within the UK, we've got a, we've, we've got a lot to offer as well. And I think the most important thing about having the opportunity to, to have discussions like this is to share this knowledge. Yeah. And also, so importantly, for all the other nations, the smaller nations, um, using a gathering like this um, for, to, to, to be able to give them help, expertise, to be able to guide them in the right direction. There's, there's so much knowledge in this room, there's so much knowledge out there, but it's, there's so much noise as well. And what we need to do is, is kind of fight our way through this, through this mud to be able to get to the, 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 real, the real core issues and the, and the real um, solutions, uh, as you will. But um, I mean, with, with regard to that, that particular question, I, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know the answers. I, don't, I wish I did, but you know, that's not my profession. It never has been. I'll fly helicopters, but I can't do that. Um, <laughs> probably couldn't fly a helicopter now, but that's not the point. <laughs> the, the point is, it's, there is, there is so much out there, but we need, amongst us here, we need to channel, it, channel, channel our focus and uh, make sure that the guys get, to, get the right amount of knowledge and the right uh, access to help. President Bush, you've talked about you know, how it's incumbent upon uh, medical professionals, the VA, to do its best on, to do their best on this issue, having sat atop that vast bureaucracy. How, how difficult is it to affect a sea change when it comes to attitudes regarding traumatic stress, uh, post-traumatic stress, and traumatic brain injury? Well, the military takes it very seriously. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I think toward the end of my presidency, we started getting a better baseline. Uh, I know they certainly do so today on on the on the uh, foot metal footprint. I guess it's kind of an oxymoron, but anyway, uh, uh, to, to the, the blueprint of his brain before combat and after combat, which is a good measuring stick. Uh, that's a change. That's because the military wanted it done. Our, our, our generals and commanders care deeply about our troops. The VA has got uh, uh, certain areas that are really good, certain geographic areas. I'm told in, uh, uh, that one of the issues in certain of the VAs is that a lot of Vietnam vets are now beginning to manifest PTS, and therefore the current vets coming back, if they so choose, are you know, uh, having a little trouble getting in, uh, which has got to be discouraging. On the other hand, you do want to take care of the Vietnam vets. And so, uh, you know, it, 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 it's such a huge country, and we're talking about so many people, that it's going to take a, uh, a multiplicity of entities working on this. And, but the government is, cares deeply. It's one reason why we've got so many top officials here. Head of the VA is going to be here if he's not here now. And uh, the whole purpose of the forum is to help hopefully redirect energies if they're being wasted. But like Harry, you know, this isn't my area of expertise either. Our area of expertise is to get people to come here and pay attention to it. And it worked. Uh, 
Yeah, and, and nobody has done more to bring attention to these issues, you could say, than DT over the last decade. Um, people have been touched by your story. People know your story. You're competing here in three events at the Invictus Games. Well, when you can channel some of your energies and some of your experiences into that kind of physical outlet, what you're doing here, how is that, how is that therapeutic? Well, for me, it's, uh, it just puts me in a zone. It's everything, I tune everything out. I'm, I'm in, I almost feel that I'm myself and my own little element, because I was an athlete, and to be able to use sports to channel that, to get me to a place where I don't have to worry about anything else but I'm doing right now, from either if it's powerlifting or chapel discus, uh, or even when I'm shooting air rifles down at the Olympic Training Center, it's just, a, it's a calming place for me, and it, and it helps a lot of us, but the, the best thing is, like, I'm still active, so I still have that camaraderie with my teammates out there, but a lot of these guys are out, so when they're able to use sports and get together, that's the closest they'll come back to being in the military, that camaraderie. So, for me, it's very calming, you know, well, except for powerlifting, I listen to some crazy stuff. That gets me going. <laughs> See, I didn't swear that time. But, uh, you, you don't want to be calm when you're lifting. You would be amped. Yeah, I, I got to get pumped up. And same with shot put. You know, but you know, when I'm cycling and when I'm shooting, it's, it's very soothing. You know, I can just go out and just ride. Or I can just focus on that target and just hit it. You know, get that perfect 10.9. You know, so it's nice. And you know, the great thing is like, my son comes out with me a lot. And he's out there with me and, you know, telling me to come on, Dad, stay strong, finish strong, and stuff like that. And sometimes I don't hear him, and my other teammates hear him. I was like, dude, your son should be like your trainer. <laughs> it's like, it's great. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, you know, I wanted to play baseball and make Daddy rich or something. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, this, you know, it is. It's very great. And it's great that, you know, everyone's here to uh, listen to this. And to have, you know, President Bush, but I really do think it's because we have a young, good-looking prince here. That's why everyone came out. Yeah. Yeah, they, don't, they don't really don't care about us. Like, yeah. ooh, it's the prince. <laughs> <laughs> uh, JJ, uh, for you, when you're out there and, and, and you're in the moment competing, um, it, ha, ha, <laughs> you lost a train of thought. You know, yeah. the, 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 there's no competing with DT. Um, <laughs> The Invictus Games have helped people. They give focus. Do, do they actually, physical activity like this, do they alleviate levels of stress as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, recovery, physical recovery is, is physical. You're in the gym all the time. You're going through the motions. You're working on certain muscle groups, etc. But it can get quite boring at the end of the day. And you are doing something which has been forced upon you effectively. Whereas sport is something you can choose to do. It's something that you, you know, it is yours and you can have your mission that you've come up with. And it was the same for why I joined the Marines. I wanted to achieve something. And so to have that again it is a massive, massive thing. Um, and then, you know, Prince Harry said that, we, that what he wanted to do was give opportunities in sport. And he wanted to give a platform where we could tell our stories and, and create some sort of good and inspire a generation, etc. Um, opportunities in sport for me, Invictus Games opened my eyes and now I'm coming back to these games to help present at them. And that, you know, I've got a career now which I've never expected to a year and a half ago and I certainly didn't expect five years ago when I was in Afghanistan. Um, but more importantly, I've been given a voice uh, and I want to have, you know, I want the opportunity to give everybody a voice and be able to change the narrative because it, our story, um, albeit the, some elements of tragedy within it, is a story of triumph at the end of the day. This is an inspirational story, and that's how it should be told, and that's how I want to continue to tell it. Um, and success at these games, for me, is to see the leaps and bounds we had for physical disability, not just for the, you know, the, the military world, but for civilian street as well. I want to see that for mental health, because if, if they can see Marines, commandos, you know, Air Force guys, whoever it is, you know, confronting this taboo, then we can do it in Civvy Street. It's as simple as that. And that's success for me at these games. Well put.
We have talked a lot about the internal messaging to, uh, to the people fighting these conditions, to the people treating them. But for the public at large, Prince Harry, uh, what is the message about? Because so many of the fears about coming forward are about how they'll be received. Uh, whether people will be scared to know that somebody is suffering from stress or traumatic brain injury. What, what is your message to the public at large about coming to terms and dealing with so many people among us who have done so many heroic things who now need to be understood in a different way? Um, firstly, there's too much generaliz generalization when it comes to, to, to mental health issues within the services. Um, there's this this weird thinking, I, I think the, the Bush Institute has done, done, done a survey which we'll, we'll find out either later today or, or later on um, uh, in the week, but essentially messages are being put out there to the general public that everyone that leaves the services is a ticking time bomb. This is simply not the case and we need to speak about it openly. Um, yes, guys have minor issues, guys, guys have major issues, but as we, said, as we said the whole way through, if you seek help early on, then you will, then you, then you will get better. Um, if, I ran, if I ran a business, I would want individuals like this, despite, mm -hmm. no, regardless of their situation, I'd want them for, for what they stand for, for the training that they've had, for the, for the, for the values that they stand up for, and so I would say to anybody that runs a business, your, your problem shouldn't be worrying about <clears throat> having these individuals in your office. Your problem should be, if I don't grab these guys now, there's not going to be enough left. That, that would, that's what I would say yeah. to the business communities. There you go. To the members of the public across the world, I would say don't be afraid to ask questions. And if you've got kids, let them ask the questions. They have, they're the ones who have no inhibitions. They'll be the ones that go up to a double amputee and say, you've got no legs, what's that all about? Don't let the parents pull you away. They've got to talk about it. There's nothing more awkward than being confronted sometimes with, with somebody who, if you ask the question, someone turns around and goes, yes, I'm receiving chemo, I have cancer. What's the next question? How do you break that ice of that conversation? That person was the, the, they're the person that brought up the conversation. They're the one that wanted to talk about it. So therefore, don't have any, any, any problems getting into a conversation and listen to what they have to say because you as an individual who had no understanding beforehand now have the ability to go away from that conversation and tell all your friends. And before you know it, you have this catalytic effect where we can, all of us, every single one of us, if ever you want to know what you can do, is just talk about it and share these experiences and listen to the stories. Thank you. Thank you. President Bush. I'm not sure I even answered your question. I think you did. I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, lastly, and, this, and what I love about America is the, the thank you for your service. And it is, you know, you, you, you lead by example, which is, which is incredibly important in today's world. And it's, a, it's an amazing foundation to, 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 to start with. But I think now we've got to the point where it needs to be more than that. It needs to be more than thank you for your service. We need to open our, we, we all need to open our doors to these amazing individuals because, as I said, you know, we, 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 we value these people. They're the ones that have put their lives on the line. Their families have sacrificed everything. And we just, they deserve so much more than, than a shake of the hand and, and, and a thank you. And in some cases, not even that. Yeah. President Bush, it's your institute. It's your symposium. Any closing thoughts? Uh, there's not an ounce of self-pity in DT or JJ or PH, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the reason I say there's not an ounce of self-pity, if, you, if you've been fortunate, like Laura and I have to meet our vets, uh, you realize that uh, they want help, but they don't want pity. And we got a lot of citizens in this country saying, woe is me, man, is my life miserable. The best thing about these games is they can take a look at DT. You want to see somebody's life was miserable at one point and said, I'm not going to let it get me down? This is the man right here. And so our vets not only can make huge contributions, and I really appreciate what you're saying about employees, but our vets can set such an incredibly good example for people who are, uh, should view themselves as fortunate to live in our country. Anyway, I want to thank you for doing this. I want to thank the Fisher House. <clears throat> I want to thank the Disney people as well. These people know how to put on a good party. <laughs> we try.
DT, President Bush, Prince Harry, JJ, gentlemen, thank you so much. That was fun. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> good job. Really good job. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, good. sir. Yeah. Thank you, Bart, man. You're the man. Yeah, I love, the, love the medals. <laughs> yeah. All right.